you got to push this down or the crucible will tip over and spill out all your silver. Silversmithing was a respected profession. Uh, many silversmiths were trusted, sort of like bankers. Jewelry would have been probably the top thing that silversmiths would make, followed by spoons. When we make spoons in the shop today, you start by casting an ingot of silver, and then that ingot of silver is hammered out through a series of stages to slowly become the spoon blank. And then once the spoon blank is made, it is struck into a tin die with a steel punch to form the bowl. It's bent straight, filed up, and polished. When we're melting and pouring silver, it absorbs a lot of oxygen. And in its liquid state, it will hold up to 20 times its own volume in oxygen. If we don't do something to try to prevent the oxygen from being absorbed, or if we don't do something to remove the oxygen once it has been absorbed, you can see the oxygen burning off. When we pour the silver into a mold to produce something, the ingot will, as it cools, you'll end up with little air holes in the ingot itself. And this is a bad thing because when you hammer it into sheet, it's more flaky and you want a solid piece of metal when you're hammering it. Now this is a good ingot, as is evidenced by the fact that there are no cracks from where it cooled it irregularly and there are no pits in it. Now all these little pieces of silver that we spilled, we will save and melt again later. In the 18th century, an ounce of silver was on average worth about three days pay for a young working tradesman. So it was very much more expensive than it is today. So silversmiths would recycle the rags that they used when polishing. They would recycle all their filings, recycle all the scrap that they cut away, melting that down. Now this hammer is called a forging hammer or a cross bean hammer. And this is the hammer that I use primarily when making spoons. Uh, this face of the hammer uh, works like a wedge, so it moves through the metal in two directions. And then this face of the hammer spreads the metal out in all directions and helps, of course, to take out the sharp hammer marks made by this hammer. Customers would recycle their silver. Customers would bring their old silverware to silversmiths, be melted down and made into new things. Sort of an affectation of the rich. The rich had silver in part as a way to uh, store some of their excess wealth. So if you had a spoon made of silver, you had a spoon made of money. Uh, when push came to shove, you needed to liquidate some of your assets. This was one of the easiest things to liquidate. This is a little flux. This protects the silver discoloration. When you've hammered silver for a while, it becomes work-hardened and brittle. So you must anneal it, which means to heat it up to about 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, and then remove it from the fire and quench it immediately in a solution of acid and water. Acid and water cools it very quickly and cleans it at the same time. It really takes a very short period of time to anneal it. Because it's the best conductor of heat, it'll heat up very quickly and it also cools off very quickly. Piece is then soft again and ready to be hammered further. The grate on the floor is to uh, catch any filings of silver that are generated as we work. You get to save all the silver that falls to the floor and you wait until there's enough of it on the floor to make it worth picking it up. Planishing hammers are designed to do nothing more than take out all the hammer marks made by other hammers. So they have nice, smooth, highly polished faces, which are used to uh, blend and remove hammer marks made by other hammers. We're using about four different polishes. The first polish we usually use is called water of air stone. It's a very, very fine abrasive. If things have little irregularities in their surface, this will level them out. Pumice takes out scratches made by the water of air stone, uh, and it also will take out file marks and fine hammer marks. But it leaves scratches that are still visible to the naked eye. So these must then be removed 
with rotten stone. Rotten stone is a very fine abrasive that begins to leave fairly visible scratches. It takes out the pumice scratches, leaving scratches that are still just visible. But you do begin to get to see a shine on the metal when you're using rotten stone. And then the final abrasive that we use is Jeweler's Rouge. So Jeweler's Rouge uh, takes out the scratches made by the rotten stone. And Jeweler's Rouge scratches are there, they're just invisible to the naked eye. So when you're done, your product ends up about as bright as that.